Um, what we're going to talk about today is how to, how to I'm going to not teach you how to steal from yourself, but I'm going to teach you what you need to watch out so people don't steal from you. It's what you need to be careful of because theft is still rampant out there. I'm a CPA, but I'm also a certified fraud examiner also, and I've done a lot of theft control work and internal control work over the years. So it's, it's always depressing when I get a phone call from clients that I think somebody's stealing from me and they want me to go and try and find it. I had three calls like that in the last four weeks. That people wanted me to see, go look through their books to see if somebody's been stealing from them, or they think money's missing, they don't know where it is, but they don't have the cash flow that they used to have. So there's different things that can bring up that question to you and whether or not you think that you have theft in your, in your uh, dealership or not, and whether or not you have the right internal control. So we're going to go through some of that stuff to help protect you. Just some of my background, I'm a used car dealer kid. My dad was a used car dealer for 20 years before we bought the new car store in 92, which we still own. So I'm a dealer kid along with being a CPA in the car business. So I actually became a CPA to get out of the car business, but ended up right back in it. So I didn't, I didn't run fast enough, I guess. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you some, these are some examples of what I pulled off the internet for dealership theft that's happened in the different years. Again, this is an office manager. We had one of our controllers that used to be in Illinois. She moved to, to, to South Carolina and went to work for this dealer. And this was one of the most trusted employees that this dealer had. She had been with him like 25 or 30 years. She did everything for the dealer, took care of all of his personal information. She was the most trusted person, went to, went to church with him, walked in the morning with him when he went to, for walks and different things like that. So basically what she did is, the only reason they called her is the, the controller that I know, she, they give out these gift cards to employees and the different customers and stuff for doing something good or bad or whatever just to make them happy. So she, tried to, she started to, to track these gift cards of who got them, how much was spent on them, when it was spent, things like that. And she found out, narrowed down, this lady was using all the gift cards. She was in charge of gift cards and she found out she was using them all herself, or probably 99% of them. Then they started looking into her a little bit further and they found out, well, she, already, she also does payroll. Well, what she was doing is she was diverting, like, she was creating like last paychecks for employees the odd number of days or something had left additional paycheck and she was directing that to her bank account rather than to the employee's bank account. And she, so she stole a lot of money that way. Along, the gift cards were minor. The payroll theft was huge. So that's how they, when you uncover one small thing, you may uncover a lot bigger thing as you dig into it a little bit further. Again, she's the most trusted employee that the dealership had. This is another lady who basically um, was stealing money and she had a co-worker. So there was collusion. Collusion is very hard to catch in a theft because you have two people working to cover it up and they're backing each other up. So this slide here shows one lady who got stole hundreds of thousands of dollars in Greenville uh, and basically she was, she was the general manager of the store so she had a lot of, lot of uh, authority to go do just about anything. Um, so they did that Along with this lady, she got her involved, and basically they embezzled hundreds of thousands of dollars from their dealer. Collusion is very, very hard to catch. Uh, both these people were with the dealer a very long time, and again, the theft involved more than $385,000 before they caught it. So we're going to go through some of that. This is a dealership manager who's also accused of embezzlement. He stole four cars. They found three of them. Didn't find the fourth one so far. Uh, and he also was taking down payments and creating fake deals and different things like that before they got him arrested. Again, it slowly unraveled after they found a couple small things. This is an auto dealership clerk, so if you don't think somebody in a, in a low position can steal, this person stole a bunch of money. She did not deposit all the cash she got from parts and service business, and nobody was checking to make sure the money that they receded in that day actually made it to the bank. So you can make up deposit slips all you want to, but unless the money actually gets traced to the bank account, you don't know if it actually got deposited or not. So be careful about that. This was another uh, dealership charge where basically um, she was taking insurance checks on the body shop claims and not reporting them. They were writing off the difference as adjustments on the body shop claims. So it looked like they had low realization on the repair orders but really, they, she was just taking all, all the insurance part of the money on most of the claims. Most of the thefts are caused by people living beyond their means. They get into, they start small. All thefts normally start very, very small. 
I had a dealership in Southern Illinois that, that had a service advisor that was filling in for another service advisor, and he actually ran a debit card through the opposite way he should have on the credit card machine. So he actually put money back into the customer's checking account rather than withdrawing from the customer's checking account. The other service advisor said, hey, you did that backwards. Let's fix it. So they fixed it. Then the service advisor, the next few days, within three weeks, he started out at 50 bucks, then he went to 100 bucks and 500 bucks. He ended up at $3,000 three weeks later trying to put money back in his account. The total was $17,000 in three weeks that he took that way. But at the same time, they were reconciling the bank statement. They were looking through and trying to, trying to find out why are all these credit card debits doing in here? Why are we having all these reversals and, and money going back to, to customers? Uh, he took off. His family, two of his family members worked at the dealership, and they made the, him and his family, they made the dealership whole for the money so they wouldn't prosecute him. But he stole $17,000 very quickly through just a mistake that happened at the dealership. Again, it started small, then he got greedy, and that's how he really got caught. He got very, very greedy and went up to 3000 bucks. So that's basically the problem that you got is that financial living beyond your means is the biggest problem that you have. You need to watch out people that if they're trying to buy a big boat or a car or they got something you don't think that they can afford based upon your payroll that you're paying them or maybe their wife's payroll or some, all, all of a sudden somebody comes into an inheritance. Be wary of that type of thing if they all of a sudden are buying different things. Not that you don't trust people, but it's just that you need to be aware that certain things cause people to steal. Uh, the next thing that happens is that they have financial difficulties. So they might have someone who's really sick in the family. You might have somebody that they're, they're, they're uh, dying or they're helping their sick sister or somebody like that get through a, f a financial troubled time. Or maybe one of their, somebody in their family went bankrupt or something like that, which happens a lot in the buyer paid industry. A lot of people do file bankruptcy. So a lot of, th a lot of things can happen and family members seem to help out other family members when they get into problems. So if you look at those top two, those top two are 70% of the problems that cause theft in dealership. They're huge. So if you just look at those two things, just be aware of your, aware of your surroundings and be aware of your employees start talking about different things. Don't ignore those. Listen to the small talk and listen to what your employees are doing in their spare time and on their part-time stuff, what they may be doing. If somebody's working a part-time job, they're probably not stealing from you because they wouldn't be working a part-time job. Your, their part-time job is stealing from you. So just be aware of other people that aren't doing that, that may have financial difficulties or sicknesses or things of that nature in their families. The third one is a close relationship with vendors. And that goes back to setting up fake vendor invoices and getting billing somebody who's not watching their accounts payable. And whoever's doing accounts payable writing checks, or maybe the office manager sets up a fake vendor and they're writing checks themselves with a name that's similar to another one of your vendors. And nobody ever goes back and looks at them and you think you're signing all the checks, but you're only signing the checks that are put in front of you. So what you should do is keep a numbering system of what checks you've got in your check number order. And if you're signing all the checks, you should put a, have a number like on a spreadsheet from 1,000 to 2,000, and as you sign that check, put a check mark by it. That way you know you've seen all the checks. If, you haven't, if you're missing a check on one of the checks, you've got to say, let me see the voided check, or where did that, see if that check cleared the bank. It's very, very critical that you do that. Otherwise, you're only seeing the checks that they present to you to sign. How long do different occupational fraud schemes last? Payroll is the longest at 24 months. It's very hard to catch a payroll because normally you have your most trusted person doing the payroll for your dealership. They're the ones who knows what everybody else makes and they gotta keep everything quiet so they're keeping everything very, very quiet because they're stealing from you. From again, that very first office manager that got, stole, that got caught up there, she was directing with direct pay directly to her checking account rather than to an employee's checking account. So that's very hard to catch because you got to go look at the bank statement and see what account number it went to and, make, and verify those account numbers back to the employee record to make sure that it actually went to the employee's account rather than somebody else's account. And again, those other employees got an extra extra gross in their paycheck they never, they never noticed and paid taxes on it. Besides her stealing the money, employees paid extra taxes on money they never even got. So a small amounts, but it added up over the years that she was doing this. The second one is, is check and payment tam tampering. So there's been a lot of stuff where people are changing a check after they write it, or they're putting it in the system one way and they're handwriting a check a different way. So what you have to do, you have to 
go and look at your bank statements and look at your checks and make, verify that the amount that's on the check is really the amount that cleared your bank statement. And if you don't do that, then you're just leaving yourself wide open for somebody to steal from you. If you look at your bank statements now, they used to be you had deposits and you had checks and withdrawals. But the, now the withdrawals or the ACHs or the EFT section is becoming at least half or more of everybody's bank statement. Everybody's doing everything electronically. They're paying bills electronically. They're getting money in electronically. They're transferring money between accounts electronically. And that's a big problem because most people don't have the documentation for somebody to go look at or the dealer to look at for all these transfers that are going in and out of your checking account. So you need to be very, very careful. If you're going to look at anything, look at your electronic transfers going out. Most people that steal aren't going to put money back in your account, so you don't have to worry about deposits. What you have to worry about is the money going out. So look at all those transfers going out and make sure that they all have some kind of documentation. So how is this fraud normally detected? By somebody giving a tip to somebody. You stumble upon it. You stumble upon it. You can see that's the highest thing. It's, it's between that and internal audit or management review, it just overwhelms those two. It's huge. So listen to somebody that says, hey, I think somebody's doing this here, somebody's doing that, or I, don't, I saw somebody take this, or I don't understand why they're doing this. Pay attention to the, what somebody says. That could be the tip that unravels everything. So it's very, very important you guys pay attention to what goes on in your dealership, keep your ears open. So how are these uh, control weaknesses come by? The lack of internal controls. So that means you got the same person Collect the money, you got the same person making out the deposit slip, you got the same person making the deposit at the bank, you got the same person doing the bank reconciliation, and the same person writing checks. And I know that when you have a small dealership, it's hard to segregate those duties, but if you can't segregate those duties and have your accountant come in every now and then and just look through stuff and see if things actually tie out. If you're not going to do it, you have somebody else do it. Otherwise, it, nobody's ever checking on that person. That person's going to have free reign to go and do whatever they want to do. If they know nobody's ever checking on them or asking questions about any invoice that was paid, there's a good chance that they can commit fraud pretty easily. So what you should do is to go back and pull vendor invoices every now and then and see if they actually match up to a check. See if that vendor is an actual vendor and not a fictitious vendor that somebody made up with a name that's similar to another one of your vendors. It's very, very important. The next thing is lack of management review. Again, we talked about most dealers are too busy in their business selling cars and managing a portfolio than they are worrying about the cash that goes out of the dealership. They just blindly sign checks they put in front of them because they trust the person. What I'm saying is trust the person, but don't trust the person. Ask questions randomly about what's going on in your dealership and what checks are going out and ask for the documentation. So how long is this occupational fraud lasts, basically. The, the longer that you're there, the more money that's taken. If you look here, more than 10 years that the employee, the employee's been there is the biggest theft. And that's because they have a long time to go and, and get that theft done. They can steal a little bit every year, and before they get caught, it's added up to 240000 bucks. The average theft that I've investigated in a dealership is four to $500,000 before it's caught because you, tr you got it with the most trusted person and they're stealing money, whether it's a general manager or an office manager or a controller or someone of that nature, they're the ones who are gonna steal and they're gonna get away with it for, for a very, very long time before they do get caught. So your motto is, it's not that I don't trust you, I just don't trust you. And you need to live and die by that. I've, I've got people that just quote that to me back and forth after they've been stolen from, and said, I wish I would've listened to that motto a long time ago, but now I live and die by it. So I trust everybody, but I'm going to go back and verify. And you should always remember that if you do want to steal, you will eventually get caught. And you got to figure out in your life, is it worth ruining your life? Is it worth losing your job? Is it worth going to jail for and are paying fines and penalties back to the dealer for the rest of your life? We had an office manager that was stealing from a dealer and it was Christmas Eve, and they had the sheriff come in and arrest her. She was pregnant. She was also the high school football coach's wife. She, was, she stole $50,000 because she didn't want to work after she had the baby. And they had her arrested and prosecuted her to the full extent. So, I mean, you can't have, you can't have sympathy for these people because they're stealing from you. If you look at how long it takes you to make $50,000, it's a long time and a lot of hard work. So you got to look at it from that angle.
The top 10 indications of, of, of control weaknesses, employees always behind in their paperwork. If you've got an employee that has a very messy desk that doesn't seem to have their act together, but they, can't, but they can seem to find uh, basically any piece of paper that you want off their desk, that's still not good enough. My sister does this at our dealership. Her desk is a mess, and I've threatened to her, I'm gonna go down and clean it up one night when she's not there. And she said, don't you dare do that. And I said, you don't have a choice. I'm gonna do it when you're sleeping. I'm gonna go down and clean off your desk and file everything away to where you don't have any stuff out in your desk except the stuff that you're supposed to be working on that day or that next day. And she's threatened, she's just gonna come after me if I do that, but I'm still gonna do it one of these days. When she least expects it, I'm gonna do it. Uh, but even, even family members, I mean, I trust my family, but I don't trust them. My, my sister verifies everything that goes on in our office at our dealership with the office manager. I've had, I've had, I've had a, a, a daughter steal $140,000 from her dad and not pay the payroll taxes and not pay his life insurance. Almost, it basically put the, put the guy under and out of business. And we had to know, it took me four years to negotiate with the IRS to only be able to pay the employee's withholding portion of the payroll taxes, not the employer's matching taxes on that. So it was a huge, huge problem, huge problem. Employees seem to be in living above their means and they don't uh, take very much time off. The reason they don't take very much time off is that they keep covering up the scam that they're doing. They got, they got to keep covering it up. They can't afford to have this lapping scheme or whatever else they're doing get away from them and have somebody else do their job. So if you can have people take time off, but have somebody else do their job whenever they're gone. That's the key. So you, it's called cross-training. So you need to have people cross-train your office. If somebody's gone, somebody else can pick up the pieces and do at least 80 to 90% of their job. Employees seem to live above their means. We talked about that. People that have financial difficulties and start to have a gambling problem or they have sick people in the family or they're trying to send their kid to college or whatever it is, that can be a problem. Or they have a kid on drugs. We had a, an office manager had her kid on drugs and she was doing everything to put him through therapy and all this other type, rehab and all this other type of stuff that she was stealing money to pay for all the rehab and, and that kind of thing. So she was doing everything she could to save her family, but she was stealing from the dealer to do that. Like I said, the most trusted employees are the ones you steal. They're the ones that have been with you the longest. They know you, you trust them, you go to church with them, but those are the ones that actually steal the most money from you. If you look at your detailed general ledgers, how many people use QuickBooks? How many people use AccountMate? Whatever, whatever general ledger system you use, you can run a detail of all your different checks and all your different expense accounts. You should look through those and see if everything looks reasonable. See if you remember signing some of the checks that, were, that are posted there, and if, see if you remember signing some of the checks for the same dollar amount that are posted there. Make sure that any manual checks you've written that you actually go back and pull that manual check to see what it actually cleared the bank for. Bank reconciliations are not completed. We, I can't tell you probably 75% of the dealers we work with don't balance their bank reconciliations on a, on a monthly basis. And if I look at him, I looked at a dealer just yesterday, and I said, he said, my bank reconciliation is balanced. I said, no, it's not. You have outstanding deposits for seven months, totaling $4,000 sitting in your bank rec. They either got deposited or they didn't get deposited. You can't have outstanding deposits for seven months sitting out on your bank rec. You can't have adjusting entries from your CPA sitting on the bank reconciliation. And I see that all the time. I see EFTs and ACHs to pay payroll taxes, and they're outstanding on your bank statement. They're not outstanding. They clear immediately the same day you call them in. So normally that stuff is not an outstanding item on your bank rec. I see very, very old checks that you've written, and maybe the dealer's in the habit of writing checks and holding those checks, but then they never send them out because it's for bird dog fees or whatever the heck it is. And they never, they never get rid of the canceled checks. You gotta clean up your bank rec. So what you should do is go back and look at your bank reconciliations and see how clean they really are. Make sure the stuff that's outstanding is just a few days old or within that same month old. If you have very old outstanding checks, you need to go and pull those checks, find out who they're to and why they're still outstanding. Employees, multiple duties and receipts and disbursements. We talked about the same person doing cash receipts, doing the bank deposit, running to the bank with the deposit, writing checks, doing the bank reconciliation, they're doing all those things that they have complete control of cash, and if you're not looking over your cash disbursements and cash receipts, 
then you don't know, number one, if all your money made to the bank, and number two is how much money went out that you didn't see, whether it's by checks that you didn't sign, that's that they forged your name. This one daughter that stole 140000 from her dad, she could, write her, she could sign her dad's name better than he could. So she forged his name on a bunch of checks that were written to her. Employee has too much control over dealership assets. We find that a lot, where you're giving them complete control over buying, and, buying different supplies and every, using whatever vendor they want to, and even paying for stuff at the auctions for you that you don't have time to worry about. So that's a real problem also. Employee has personal or family problems. That seems to be the biggest indicator besides living beyond your means of why people steal. It's a really bad statistic. I think 40% of the people will steal from you anytime for any reason, is what the certified fraud examiners have told me in the association. Basically, they've done some surveys. And another 10 or 15% will steal if given the opportunity. So that means you've got a 50 to 55% chance of an employee stealing from you if the opportunity presents itself and they're in a bad situation. That's not a good number to have. It's kind of depressing, actually. It's very depressing. So some controls you have. How many people know where their dealer plates are at? Does everybody know where all their dealer plates are at? You got to normally assign to different people. I mean, what I normally find out this is a problem is when we do a buy sell at a, at, a, at a new car store and a dealer's got 120 plates and we can only find 100 of them. Where are the other 20 plates at? Nobody knows because nobody kept a record of them. You should keep a log of who you got them signed out for and ask them to present it from time to time if you haven't seen it in a while or if you don't know if they actually still have it. So that's a big thing. That's something you need to, if you have missing plates, make sure you report them to the state right away. That is a missing plate. Otherwise, you're liable. You could be liable in your insurance company if that person has that plate and they wrecked the car. We had a, a, a detail guy that was taking some of our used cars on the weekend and joyriding around town with one of our dealer plates. And the only reason we got caught is because somebody, somebody tipped us off and said, hey, why is so-and-so riding around town with one of your dealer plates in this, in this car? So we fired him the next day on Monday when he came back to work. But he was just ta taking cars, leaving his car at our dealership and taking one of the other cars just got traded in. And he was going to clean up that next week, put a deer plate on it riding around town. Not a good deal. Not a good deal. So if you have extra plates, you should lock them up so nobody can take them and then keep track of which ones you do have out there. You should have required mandatory vacations from everybody. So have somebody leave for at least one week at a time and have somebody else do their job while they're gone. That person, if that person can't cross-train somebody to do 70 or 80% of their job while they're gone, that's a problem. What happens if that person gets ill or gets sick or gets hit by a car or an accident or whatever happens, or their husband decides they're going to move to another town, you're stuck without somebody who's even cross-trained to do some of the basic stuff in your dealership. That's not a good deal. So cross-training is very important, not only just for some temporary things that can happen, but also for some long-term things that could happen to you. Be aware of any person experiencing all these personal problems. Uh, most of the people that we've investigated that stole money had some of these problems. I had a dealer say he was looking at his credit card statement every month, and, made, and I asked him, I said, are you sure everything on there is okay? Yeah. We found out that the office manager charged a $4,000 hot tub to the dealer's credit card, and the dealer didn't see it. I said, so that tells me the dealer wasn't looking at his credit cards like he told me he was. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. You can't tell me you can't see a $4,000 charge for a hot tub on your credit card. You had, had to not be looking at those every month. Know where all your vehicles are. Like again, make sure that you know where all your vehicles are at. If they're out at some sublet place or they're at the auction or wherever they're at, make sure you know that you've accounted for all your vehicles. Do what we call a physical inventory of your vehicles from time to time with your inventory list and see if you have them all. A lot of our new car dealers don't know a car is stolen until they go out to try to show it to somebody and they can't find the car. Or the floor plan lender says, I can't find this car and nobody can recall ever lending it out or going on a test drive or anything like that, and they found out that we have to report it stolen. So you should do some kind of a physical inventory from time to time to make sure that you have all your cars that you can account for them. Gas tickets. This is another big problem. My dad used to have a gas pump at the dealership when he was a used car dealer. And as soon as he became a new car dealer, I said, shut down the gas pump, use up all the gas for the, for the used cars, fill them all up, let's get rid of the gas pump. He goes, why? I said, because that's the easiest place for somebody to steal, unless you're going to put a camera on it, and you're going to go back and review all the footage and check it against the log of what everybody took 
gas out of it. You don't know if everybody filled up their own car, their girlfriend's car, or if they filled up whatever, gas cans and took them home. I said, you don't know. So we got rid of the gas pump. The other problem we got is we got people that are in collusion at a gas station you always use, and I, a salesman goes up and fills up a car that's gonna be sold, but he also fills up his girlfriend's car because she meets him at the gas station. That's another problem that you gotta have. So you should be, have some good, kind of a good relationship with the gas station owner, and they have, make sure they have cameras, so if you need to, you can go back and look at their camera footage if you think somebody's stealing, or you're trying to wonder, where's all this gasoline going? Where's all this gas going? I can't, I can't have filled up that many cars with gas. So look and just look at your gas tickets from time to time and say, how many gallons, track that per month, how many gallons did I use this month versus next month versus the following month, and keep track of that according to your sales and number of cars you have in inventory and see if it makes any random sense at all. See if it makes any sense at all. Check health insurance bills. How many people pay some or part of their health insurance bills for employees, okay? What you have to watch out for here is that the rates keep going up on health insurance. What happens is if you're charging your, your employees 50% of the health insurance premium or something of that nature and it goes up, you gotta increase their withholding to allow for that increase. And we find this quite a bit where health insurance has went up for the first of the year or the middle of the year whenever their premium goes up and nobody ever changed employee deductions for what the increased amount should have been coming out of their paycheck. So the dealership is eating the whole increase of that health insurance premium themselves without the employees sharing in it. So that's normally whoever does the payroll. So get together with whoever's doing your payroll and get your current health insurance bill out and see if it matches up with the correct withholdings based upon what you're doing with those employees. Collusion is very hard to catch. We talked about that general manager and office manager with collusion. That's extremely hard to, to catch when you got somebody like that. Just be aware of some, of some people who are a little too chummy with each other and go out after work together. Just not that you have to not trust them, but just be aware of what's going on and what kind of controls or what kind of duties that you have both those people doing. And nothing else, check them randomly to make sure that what they're doing that they have control over that you have looked at randomly to see if that's really true transactions that happen in your dealership or not true, true transactions. Dealers and managers must set the standard. Again, when my dad became a new car dealer, I said, Dad, you went from five employees to 40 employees overnight. I said, everybody's gonna be watching you, so you have to set the gold standard. He already had a gold standard when he was a used car dealer. He didn't do anything screwy or anything like that. He always ran it the right way. But I said, you have to be extra specially careful that everything you do or say is gonna be watched by 40 people. And anything you do or say is gonna travel through that dealership like wildfire. So be careful what you tell people, be careful what you do, be careful how you, how you make different types of determinations of how you're gonna handle different customers because your people will learn from that and they'll do the same thing. You may have done something one time just to get out of a situation, but they think that's the standard now, so they're gonna do that every time. So be careful about that. Search the desk of employees. When I go down to our dealership or some of our other dealerships I go to on a monthly or quarterly basis, I'll just start going through the salesman's desk. I'll start emptying out the drawers on top of the desk. I find bank statements, credit card statements, utility bills, checkbooks. I find a little bit of everything in a lot of people's desk. I go back to service manager's desk and find out how many service repair orders he's got scrolled away. How many parts tickets have never been turned into the county because the county can't find them. Well, it's on the statement, don't worry about it. So you'll find all kinds of, these, of this paperwork. Normally you don't find it until somebody quits, you go clean out their desk with a new person. Don't wait that long. Go back and do it on a regular basis. You have the right to go back through anybody's desk. You own that desk, you own that, that anything that's in that desk, basically. If they got personal stuff in their desk, they need to take it home. Your office is not their office. Have anything, if, if their credit card statement gets stolen out of their drawer, who's gonna be liable for that? They're gonna try to come back to you and say, you, should, you didn't have good enough security and dealership in the showroom, I, should, I shouldn't have lost my credit card statement to somebody else. So be careful about that. We've had that happen at some dealerships where the dealership had to fight a lawsuit from the, from the salesman who had a credit card statement in this drawer and it got stolen by somebody. And then he had theft on his credit card. Not a good deal. You should let all personnel know they're gonna be prosecuted to fullest extent. We had a, 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 um, a runner at our dealership. She took the deposit to the bank. But before we take do a deposit in the bag, the office manager gets the deposit slip ready. My sister verifies that they initial it both. So they both know how much cash is in that and checks are in that bag. They go to the bank. 
they, she brought the bank bag back, this runner did, and it was $50 short on the deposit. It said the only, only way it could have got lost is that you took the money from here to the bank because you only went three miles to the bank. You're the only one who had control of that bank bag. So we fired her. We just don't tolerate any kind of theft. We had, we had our cash drawer in the back of the service department for miscellaneous cash receipts for people that wanted to pay their bill back there for all changes or something like that. And 20 bucks went missing one day. So my sister called me and said, we were 20 bucks short on the, on the uh, drawer this week. I said, okay. So let me know if it happens again. What happened again it was 120 bucks the next time. I said, okay, it's always, she said, all the $20 bills are missing, only $20 bills. I said, okay, I said, I'm going to be down there next week for our meeting. We'll have a meeting with the parts of service people, and we'll discuss this. So I called them each individually, and I said, here's the deal. If another penny goes missing out of the drawer back there in the parts of service here that you guys have control over, I'm putting in cameras from every angle possible, and we're going to have them on 24 hours a day. And if we catch you stealing the money, you're immediately fired, and we're going to prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. And your name's going to be in the paper, and you're going to lose your job. All of a sudden, no more money went missing. No more money went missing. Until then, they, like I said, they took $20 the first time. Nobody really said anything. 120 bucks went missing the next time. That's why I said, okay, we're done. $20 could be a mistake, but not, 100, not, not every $20 bill missing. And we went back and looked at the cash receipt that day, and there wasn't that much cash taken and, and money given back out to a customer for, 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 for change. So we knew that somebody did take the money. Review your insurance policy for employee dishonesty. You guys should look at your employee dishonesty coverage on your insurance policy and make sure it's at least three to $500,000 worth of coverage. It's very, very cheap coverage. Most times it might only be twenty-five dollars to $50,000. It's not that high. You need to be careful that you have enough. What they're going to do is, and all the claims I've investigated is basically, the insurance company is not going to pay you for an account or somebody come in and find it, but they're going to reimburse you for the amount of money that that person does find and can authenticate to the insurance company that this is the amount that was stolen. That's the reason why I became a CFE. I was, we have we have so many dealership thefts 20 years ago. I said, I need to have some extra authority to go up to these insurance companies to say, look, I'm certifying this. I know what I'm doing. This is the documentation for it. This person stole $300,000. Pay the claim. And that's the reason why I became a CFE, almost out of necessity, to help fight the claims for the dealers. Look at your bank accounts. You should go to your bank that you deal with and ask them, what accounts they have in your, in your name or your dealership's name at that bank. And make sure you have all those on your general ledger system and that they're all accounted for. How do you know that somebody hasn't opened up another bank account, forged your name on the signature cards, or you just signed it because they need another bank account and you just didn't even think about it because your office manager explained that to you, your controller explained it to you, and all of a sudden they're using that money to funnel money out of the dealership. It looks like a normal transaction in the account in your name, but it's actually their account and their name with, with the dealership name on it, but they're the one who controls the money. Do background checks. How many people do a background check of their employees? Okay, you should do background checks on everybody. It's very, very important. Not only on that, but also maybe on your wholesale vendors, because your wholesale vendors can rip you off too, basically. So find out if they've ever been convicted of something from theft of a dealership or not paying a check or bad checks or something like that. You should check out your vendors. Require people to change your passwords. I had a theft in a new car Ford store. The dealer called me up and said, I want you to log on to the system, the ADP system. I want you to download these transactions and look at them and tell me if you think there's theft. Well, there was. The office manager stole $140,000. So what I did is I documented it and printed it all off. We went in the next day. I called the office manager in and me and the dealer put her on, 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 on uh, leave of absence. Said you need to go home. What's the first thing? She, first thing I did as soon as she left the office, I went into the system and changed every, and blinded everybody's password. They had to log out and log back in with the new password. They couldn't keep the old password. The office manager went home more than 20 minutes that we just let go, basically. She tried to log on from home with her old password and couldn't get in. She then, so she, could, she couldn't get in, she called one of her friends in the office that worked there and said, hey, can you go get these, these reports stuff? I need to work on those tonight. I'll come pick them up a little bit later. She was going to destroy some of the records that showed that she took money. She didn't realize that I'd already downloaded everything electronically. We already had her 
had her the goods on her basically. So whatever she destroyed, it wouldn't have made a difference. But again, you got to immediately lock down the office so that nobody can steal. That's a really big one that seems to. Oops, hit the wrong button. There we go. Okay, general ledger controls. Look through your detailed general ledger, especially in cost of sale accounts and sale accounts, and make sure that you really have sales and cost of sales in those accounts. If I'm going to steal from you and I want to hide it, I'm going to hide it where there's big numbers at. That's sales and cost of sales. So look through all that detail in your general ledger and make sure that you, what's in there is really a reconditioning cost or it's the cost of the vehicle or something that you're aware of that's got charged there. If you have policy adjustments of goodwill that are given out to customers, which you guys have a lot of normally, you should look and make sure that you see all those goodwill adjustments, that you approved those goodwill adjustments. Make sure that whatever you gave free to somebody to make them happy, you know which customer you had to make happy, why you had to make them happy, and how much it cost you to do that. And then try to figure out how can I solve this problem and not have to do that again the next time. Because goodwill adjustments are expensive. If you general ledger detail, again, I can't specify how important that is to go through your detailed general ledger on a monthly basis or an a, a quarterly basis, do a look back and see what kind of activity went through your different accounts and see if you notice everything that seems to make sense with, with what's going on. In QuickBooks or AccountMate or whatever system you normally use in general ledger, when you enter that transaction, you can make an entry and put a comment or a description of what you're doing, whether it's a vendor name or something you bought or just something as a reference number or something like that to help you identify what this transaction is. So when you go through this detailed general ledger, you can help identify what that transaction is really for. I bought balloons or I bought whatever it is. At least I can tell what it is and what vendor it is. So I can immediately go pull that vendor bill, look at that invoice, and say, yeah, this is a valid expense that I, that I should have paid. The entry should be recorded by the correct employee. Some of these systems don't record who logged on and did it. Some, most of them do nowadays. So you can tell if somebody went in and made an entry to reverse something out or voided a check or, or whatever, something of that nature. Um, if somebody's making a lot of adjusting entries at month end, you've got to keep reconciling your books. You need to go find out why you've got to keep making all these big adjusting entries to reconcile your books at, at each month end. If, if you keep having to make all these big entries, they're not recording something right during the year, during the month, during the year, and you have to go back and correct that either at month end or at year end. So it's very important that you go back through and try to stop the grief, we call it, from making all these adjusting entries and fixing your books. Credit card controls. What you want to do is make sure you do look at your credit card statement every month. Please look at your credit card statement every month and know what's going on there. You guys charge everything in the world on your credit cards to get the miles and stuff like that get the points. So be sure you look at all that. Make sure that you're only paying your credit card. If I want to steal from you, I got a MasterCard at this through Chase Bank or whatever it is, I'm going to go get one exactly the same as the dealership and I'm going to pay your bill and my bill at the same time. So it's written out to Chase Bank. So that means before you sign a check, you need to make sure you authorize that electronic fund transfer to pay that credit card off. You need to make sure you're only paying off your credit card bill and not somebody else's credit card bill along with that. The dealer and his family should have personal credit cards also. Don't use the company credit card for personal stuff. Not good for the IRS to be looking through all your personal stuff on a company credit card. So have a separate credit card for that. Payroll controls. How many people hand out payroll checks to people? How many people have a direct deposit? Okay, it's about half and half, okay. So more and more people are going direct deposit, which is good. So at least you know who your employees are. What we found is that you should be looking at your payroll reports each month in and each quarter in. Just go in and learn how to run a payroll report yourself. Or if you use an outside payroll service, have that person, have that payroll service mail you something at home on the reports. Look through those and make sure you don't have fake employees. Make sure you only, if you have four paychecks per week, per month I mean for an employee, make sure there's only four and not five. We had an office manager steal $400,000 by issuing additional paychecks each month to himself for three years before it got caught. The dealer wasn't looking at the W-2s. He wasn't looking at the payroll reports to see if the gross wages were even close to what he supposedly was paying this office manager. So you gotta be careful about that also. I can issue a zero dollar paycheck that never clears the bank, is not ever signed, and steal you blind. It's a zero dollar paycheck, never cleared the bank, and nobody ever had to sign it because it's zero dollars. How did I steal from you? Any idea? 
I cut myself an extra $3,000 gross payroll and had it all withheld in federal taxes. And when I filed my tax return at the end of the year, I got all that money back. I just stole $3,000 from you. Very, very, very important you look at payroll reports. Very, very important. Look at the W-2s at year end before you sign the W-3 and make sure that the gross wages seem reasonable for the people and the pay plans that you had them on. Uh, drivers, how many people use drivers? Everybody has drivers, right? Put them on your payroll. If they have an accident, what's the first thing they're going to tell somebody? I work for Joe Blow Ford. Hello? You got a workman's comp claim immediately if you have an accident. Put them on your payroll and cover them by workman's comp. Don't wait for an accident to nail you and have the, all that liability there and then argue whether or not they were an employee or not. You, it's very, very hard for a driver, for you, for you to convince the IRS or the state that the driver is not an employee. You control where they go, when they go, and how they do it. And they normally don't submit bills to you from a company that they're self employed or a contractor with you. So drivers are almost always employees, always. I'm going to go click on cash controls, basically. Again, look through all your, your EFT and ACHs on your bank statements. That's very, very important. Almost half or more of the transactions are electronic now, not checks and deposits. So make sure you look through that. The only way you're going to check that is to go online. And normally the documentation for those deposits or transfers in and out, there's no documentation there. You don't have a check number. You don't have who it was made to or anything like that. You might have an account number it went to, but that's it. So you should do, make a list of those account numbers. If you keep seeing the same account numbers month after month, then basically what you want to do is to find out what account number that is and who it belongs to and make sure it's going, the money's going to the right place. Uh, wire transfer is the same thing. If some dealers have accounts that no money can ever be transferred out to another account unless, unless they have that dealer's specific approval at the bank, that's, that's very important. Bank reconciliations. Bank reconciliations should be done every month. It should be accurate. It should be done timely. Before you reconcile the rest of your trial balances, you basically should do your bank rec. You can't do your reconcile the rest of your receivables and inventories and things like that and counts payable if your bank reconciliation does a balance and you're way off. I mean, I can't tell you how many bank reconciliations I've seen where you take the balance per the bank and you're going to go to the balance per your general ledger and I look at the bank rec, and they're balancing to a number in between there that means nothing. It ties to no number anywhere. And I can't tell you how many bank recs I've seen that way. So it's very, very important. Look at the, you don't really get checks back anymore, but you should go online and flip over the checks and just look at them randomly. Or go and just ask your office manager, uh, check number 1534 is made out to so-and-so. I want to look at that check and the bill that we paid. Just randomly go and check on that type of stuff. Um, Two signatures on a check are okay. That just means if you have collusion, it's easy for them to do it because you got those two people normally signing them, a general manager and office manager. So just be careful. You still need to look at the checks even though you require two signatures. I can, for, I can write my signature and I can forge yours. It's real easy to do. So two signatures don't hold a lot of water with me, basically. Look for sequential check numbers. Again, if you think you're signing all the checks, you may just be only signing the checks that are put in front of you. So have a list, and when you sign a check for check number 1,000, check it off in your list. You sign 1,001, you check it off. You go through your list. If you're missing a check, you got to go find out, was it a void check or did it clear the bank? If it cleared the bank and you didn't see it, and you're supposed to sign all checks, you'd find out was out of town that day, and they had to make an emergency check disbursement, or what happened. Also, if you have these systems where you're printing a check, basically, your laser printers, you got these pre-printed laser stock forms that you get for checks. Make sure those checks on those forms, they're blank, have a check number on them. But when you print your number out of the system, it should print on the check underneath that number, and you verify that that number matches the check number, and you make sure that all checks are accounted for. If you have a bunch of blank check stock, you should have that locked up so nobody can just take a check off the bottom of it and go forge a check on you. We've had dealers lose money that way. The bank they had to go back to the bank and make it good, but they had to go through the hassle of somebody's forging a check on them. Limit checks made out to cash. You guys live with cash, with spiffs, and paying for stuff with cash. Quit using as much cash in your dealership. If you quit taking cash from customers, don't use as much cash in your dealership. Use checks or credit cards that are, have more, more controls on them and have actually some verification paperwork behind them. Cash just disappears. So quit using cash. 
Make sure all voided checks, you should sit there and go through what, if you're missing a check number on your bank statement, make sure it's voided or it cleared in, in, in the prior month or it's going to clear in the next month. Find out who it went to. So that missing little star in your bank statement means something. It means that a check didn't clear. So make sure that it's a voided check or it's accounted for correctly. It may clear in a later month that you're not looking. F&I controls. How many people do outside retail deals? Anybody do outside deals? Okay, just a few people. Be careful about F&I companies or banks or financial institutions giving kickbacks back to your F&I people, send them all the deals. They may be sending them the deals and it's good for the F&I person, but it's not good for the dealership because he's not making as much F&I income off that bank as he would if you went to the, a normal bank. So be careful if you're doing retail deals that you have a good relationship with that F&I lender that you're dealing with and they understand they're not to give kickbacks back to your employees. You're paying them the payroll they're supposed to. You don't need them to supplement their payroll. Um, how many people have not had an 8300 form audit? $10,000 rule, anybody run into that? Okay, we had a little old lady look like a grandma walking our dealership one day and she said, hi, I'm from the IRS, I'm here to do a Form 8300 audit. Well, she was gone in a half an hour because she looked through our car deal jackets and they were immaculate. We had copies of cash, we had copies of everything in there to prove it was cash, check, credit card, whatever it was. We had documentation. So documentation will help you if you ever have one of those audits to prove what is cash and what's not cash. Accounts receivable. You guys don't have a lot of accounts receivable. You have some, but you have notes receivable. But you may have side notes. You may have repairs that you're doing for people. You want to make sure that nobody's writing off those accounts receivable and you're not aware of it. So every month you should look at the accounts receivable list and then if it's gone the next month, you should find out did I actually get paid or did I get write, written off. Find out what happened to that receivable from the month before. Look at what your employees are charging and make sure somebody is not writing those off. On down payments, we've had a lot of theft and down payments where the down payments got made to a deposit slip, but the down payments never made it to the bank because the general manager or the salesman ran by the deposit by the bank that day on his way home. So the cash never made it to the bank. We had a new car dealer that lost $15,000. It was supposedly locked in the F&I safe one night. It wasn't there the next morning. They never did find out who took that money. Check car deals have little or no gross profit to friends, relatives, and family members. Accounts payable. Hunt for fictitious vendors. I was looking through a dealer's vendor list the other day and it had ABC Supply Inc. and it had ABC Supply LLC. Somebody set the name up twice by mistake but that's, how, that's what happens. You see ABC Supply when you sign the check, and you don't, you don't notice that it's Inc. versus LLC. And I just stole money from you. I just stole money from you very, very easily. So what my, my brother signs all the checks in our dealership, and I know he does because he has a checklist he goes by. But before he signs a check, all the paperwork has to be attached to that check. And he verifies that what he's paying is a dealership bill. He recognizes who the vendor is. He's authorized that vendor. And... The amount is the right amount based upon the bill that's being paid. You should look at through your vendor list and get rid of any vendors that you don't need. My dad took over the new car dealership. There were five vendors they were buying spark plugs from. He said, I don't need two. So he got rid of three vendors. That was three extra checks they were writing every month on a statement that they got rid of. And they did. A, he went through all the different vendors and got rid of like 40 or 50 different vendors that they didn't really need. And just consolidated his purchases and got better deals. Review cell phone bills. If you're paying for cell phone bills for your people, make sure they didn't go do an upgrade for you and you're not aware of it. And you're paying extra charges or they changed their plan and you weren't aware of that either. They got more data or whatever. Look and make sure that the cell phone bills that you're paying are all authorized based upon the charges that are appearing on those. And if you authorize a new phone, make sure it's a new phone for them and not somebody else. Internet bills are another one. Make sure I'm not paying your internet bill at home with my internet bill. Same thing as utilities, utilities expenses. Make sure I'm not paying my water bill and your water bill. Same thing with real estate taxes. Same type of thing. We've had some thefts on lien payoffs where basically you're paying off a lien on somebody's car, but I found out I'm paying my brother's lien off at the same time. It's going out as an EFT on your bank statement so you don't really notice it. it's electronic, and you don't ever go back and check that electronic funds transfer. I just paid off a lien on my brother's car, and you didn't even know I did it. So you got to look at these electronic fund transfers. Personal property taxes. We've had dealers where office managers are paying their personal property taxes in the states where they have personal property taxes along with the dealerships. 
Nobody ever looks at those checks. They see those personal property and real estate tax bills are confusing anyhow. They have all kinds of numbers. Nobody ever looks at location codes. Nobody ever looks at, at those numbers, those ID locator codes, to find out if it's their property or not property. A lot of times they don't even have an address on them. It just has a locator number and some description of what the property was, but it doesn't tell you where it actually is located. Just remember, you guys are in charge of internal control. You guys are the ones who have to watch it and monitor it and check back on a random basis to make sure that you do have good controls or do you have some kind of control in your dealership where you're looking at stuff after the fact. And again, my motto is not that I don't trust you, I just don't trust you. Live and die by that and you won't get hurt so often. Thank you very much.